SJC 13450, Commonwealthy Daniel Rogers. Attorney Nathanson, good morning. Good morning, Chief Justice Budd, and may it please the court. David Nathanson for Daniel Rogers. Um, I hope to reach three arguments today, uh, the ineffective assistance uh, claim and its sub-issues. I hope to very quickly hit the shoplifting issue, statutory interpretation, um, and then the reduction in verdict. Um, but really throughout, I'm asking the court to please focus on the basic reality of this situation. Danny Rogers was a five foot five black homeless man stealing shoplifting toothpaste. He snuck out of the CVS, he ran, he tried to get away. He was chased down by three people with knives shouting, come here, N-word. Um, he dropped most of, most of the toothpaste. They slammed him against a concrete wall. They knocked him to the, to the sidewalk. Um, in the altercation, he sustained a defensive wound to his non-dominant hand. Um, so he was charged with and convicted of felony murder. Um, the jury did not convict him of assault with intent to murder of Henry Young. They did not convict him of deliberate premeditation of Christian Jambrone. Um, he could never avoid life without parole, though, unless he defeated armed robbery. Um, the jury were given a path to felony murder built on technicalities, what this court called constructs in its uh, opinion on direct appeal. Um, and those constructs are it's armed robbery because he used force in the escape phase, um, and so he's constructively the first aggressor, uh, even though he is not, in fact, the first person to use force. Um, and because he's constructively the first aggressor, there's no self-defense, um, and so it's felony murder. Um, Dr. Rin's testimony presented a way off that highly technical path to felony murder. Um, presenting a, a fight or flight theory to the jury just makes common sense, right? People when understand. did that fight or flight theory trigger uh, for your client? The testimony is it triggers when the physical confrontation begins and reaches its apex when he believes he sees a knife. And that, that is after the toothpaste is taken? Yes. After he runs? Yes. And, and, and he's at that point armed with a three inch pocket knife, is that right? It's three or two, but yes, it's a folding pocket knife. Okay. It's in his pocket. Um, and what is the you know, a testimony um, about Dr. Is it Rin's? Rin, yeah. Dr. Rin's um, bases in science for this theory that the um, panic attack, I guess is what he calls it, panic um, episode, happened yes. when, he, when your client was slammed against the wall. Right. So what he, he testifies um, is Does that- Does he cite any- um, journals or other authority that this type of instantaneous-ish panic attack is something that is scientifically sound. So it's, he never testifies that it's instantaneous. It, what he testifies to is that it begins and, and then reaches its apex at the point, and when it reaches its apex, that's when it overwhelms the higher cortical functions, the subcortical functions take over. Okay, okay? so when, uh, when this apex happens, is there any authority that he references in his testimony or in his report um, that supports that? Yes, so... so what is that? Um, so he t first of all, he, he testifies um, to his qualifications. He testifies. No, 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 I'm not. I think that the the motion judge said he was qualified. I'm focused yeah. on the scientific um, bases for this apex of panic. So um, there's two answers to that. The the first and most direct answer is in his report. He cites an article by Fikretolu. I'm sorry, by who? Fikretolu. F i k r e t o g l u. Okay. Uh huh. It's in his report. Um, and we certainly could have gone further into that, but nobody asked, right? Well, I mean, the defendant bears the burden of proof at this point, right? Well, it, so... You're um, offering expert testimony. It has to be <coughs> able to pass Daubert-Lanigan. So the Figure Tolley article is what 
is being relied on for the uh, scientific soundness of an apex panic attack theory? So that's not only it. Right. Okay. So, there, so that's one thing. That that, that's one. Anything else? Yes. He, he testifies that it's a recognized phenomenon in the field, that there were five. But, but what is his basis deserve footnote uh, or, you know, something that says it's recognized in such study, in such book, in such but, journal, anything? So I address that in my brief. Um, yeah, but can you do we, it now? Yeah, yes. Because this is, this is of what course. I'm concerned about. Yeah. Right. And, and what I say in my brief and, and what I'm saying to you now is that he's not allowed to get into uh, hearsay bases of support on direct examination. That's, that's the rule. The Commonwealth never ex examined him on the, the scholarly bases, the, the, the methods, right? They never, they ex just e examined him on, didn't you consider this fact? Didn't you consider that fact, right? The Commonwealth filed a, a motion, but they filed an opposition in which the only thing that they substantively, pardon me, the only thing that they substantively argued in the opposition was that Dr. Rin wasn't qualified and complained about not having the CV, which I then provided to them well in advance of the, of the motion for a new trial. And it was, in fact, introduced at the motion for a new trial. Um, that was the only substantive challenge to Dr. Rin's testimony. Um, when, we, when we got through Dr. Rin's qualifications, I asked the motion judge, May but I yeah, proceed? you're focused on his qualifications, and I think the motion judge found that he was qualified. Was qualified, yes. Right, okay. And so, what we then what we then have is no further questions, right? So I I asked him about, you know, is it supported in the field? Yes. Um, he, you know, he's the author of one of the lines of research. It's been studied in detail. No further questions. So, so there's the Figure Tolly article, and then um, Dr. Rin himself has. A line of research you're saying that was yes that's Talk, in in reference to where in his testimony in a report and affidavit both the, the his it, line of research yes okay. talking about cortical versus subcortical functions and which takes over right so no but in this particular aspect of the apex theory of panic attack no okay no so not that not that. Okay. Um, okay, but the, the motion judge says, my search for medical or psychological support for Dr. Rin's opinions was unsuccessful. So he's just equally importantly, a computer search of the use of such theory in court cases produced meager results. So all that's wrong? The judge is wrong on that? It's a notice and opportunity problem. That's the problem, right? Better, Be you, you're talking in code. What do you mean? Yeah, yeah. so, so what, I, what I'm saying is I was presented with a specific challenge to the doubt uh, having to do with qualifications. I addressed it, we moved on. There were 19 days. Putting in a, a novel medical theory, don't you need to, and, and the judge says, look, this, this isn't what the DSMR says. This is something different. Don't so, you need to put in an article? Um, don't you need to submit some support for that? No, and, really? And the reason for that, and, and, and let me ask a follow up question. And you're really prohibited from putting that in on direct? You're prohibited from putting in that study you just mentioned? Yes, that, that's the rule that's recited in, in, in my brief. So, um, the, I'm sorry, what rule of evidence is that? that the... You can't elicit hearsay bases of support for your opinion on direct appeal. It's only when you've been crossed on your, ba on your, on your, uh, on your bases, right? The Commonwealth versus Juvenile line of cases? Yes, okay. yes, exactly. So, um, but <clears throat> there's, there's two problems with that. It, the DSM is improper judicial notice, right? But also, um, it, the notice and opportunity problem. If you don't meet the, ju the DSMR, whatever, I, I got my initials wrong. If you don't meet that and you're doing something different, if the, you can put in the DSMR, but if the DSMR says the opposite, this is DSM-5. Yeah, it's, yeah, yes, the five. Yes, it doesn't support that. Don't you need to do something? There's no proper. Pro, there's first of all, there's no proper evidence that it doesn't 
right? We, doctor, doctor. Judge does a pretty detailed description of why right. it's not on play. And that was, yeah, go ahead. And is your, I, I your, apologize. Your comment about notice and opportunity is that this was surprise? Yes. Yeah, that yes. you didn't have the chance to yes. address it. It was essentially that. a bait and switch. I was told that the problem was qualifications. 19 days passed between the close of Dr. Rin's testimony and the, and the hearing on the motion, on the argument on the motion for new trial. When we argued the motion for new trial, the judge never asked me about the DSM. The judge never asked me about any, any Daubert issues. The Commonwealth never argued any Daubert issues. The Commonwealth never argued any DSM. So it is a notice and opportunity issue, and the DSM itself says lay people shall not use this diagnostically, right? So that is an, an improper use of the DSM. Um, so I, with, and I, I just wanna say, um, this court has said that when a, uh, a test, when testimony, uh, expert psychological testimony has been approved in the past, uh, Daubert is, is presumptively satisfied. So yeah, right? that was my other question. Has yeah. this apex theory of panic attack been approved in the past? Well, panic as an impairment, right? Panic as an impairment. Not a panic disorder. No. Okay. Right, so and that's gray, your right? Your actual theory that Dr. Rin was pursuing, has that been accepted? Yes. At, in, in a case in the Yes. Past? Okay, what case is gray. that? Gray, gray, which is at volume 399 of, of Massachusetts uh, reports. That is a panic attack theory, apex? Not attack, that, that was a person who, uh, of low IQ yep. who panicked in a situation where he was, uh, he, he was telling people not to back away from him. and and them backing away from him made him panic, and he stabbed them. It, it is pretty close, right? Mr. Rogers, the, the, attest, the, the evidence is that he is a person of somewhat low IQ, and that he, uh, he panicked, right? Um, and so, and there's all this evidence beyond Dr. Rin, right, from Michael Andrick, that uh, the trauma from being a homeless person um, makes people hyper defensive. Dr. Rin testified that in neurology, this provides what's called kindling for panic. Um, it's a neurological kindling. Um, and so Dr. Rin's testimony was a standard psychological opinion. There was no reason to question it. It is, Would, but it's, it's, it's not, other than the Gray case, which sounds slightly different, so you're arguing ineffective assistance of counsel, right? Yes. So what uh, made uh, the decision or the failure to pursue this defense, um, as opposed to the intoxication and drug defense, um, fall below the ordinary fallible lawyer mark? Because he was pursuing an impairment theory based on intoxication, but he never had his client evaluated. And so the failure to investigate, a choice, a strategic choice, can never be reasonable unless it's based on investigation. And that's what this court has said in any number of cases. And he didn't complete the investigation before he made that choice. So right? any time a lawyer fails to subject their client to a mental health professional, that's ineffective? What, what, so obviously not, right? So um, what made this, what, what in your client presented to um, the lawyer information to suggest that a mental health uh, evaluation would have been um, fruitful? So he, he raised intoxication, that, right? right that's because a, that's he a mental was actually intoxicated, wasn't he shooting up heroin, I think? Yes. Yeah. So, so, so that, that, that makes sense. That's a, it, right. In, so, in, in an appropriate investigation. Right. And, and so that, um, I apologize. So, 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 I'm sorry. So how does that dovetail with a mental health evaluation? Because he's raising Mr. Rogers' mental Once state. Once you've raised a defense of intoxication or sort of, uh, impairment of some sort, you have to then go beyond and do um, a mental health evaluation? Do you have to investigate? Yes. Yes. Okay. So yes. every time a mental impairment as a result of drugs and or um, alcohol is raised under your regime would require the lawyer also to subject the client to a mental health evaluation. In, in, in these circumstances, yes. Okay. Um, what, I really, what circumstances? 
I'd really like to get to the to the reduction, and I think okay, I can. Can you do... answer my question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I didn't hear the full question. I'm sorry. I know because you cut me off. I'm sorry. Mental health impairment. When you said in these circumstances, I, I had pro set forth a proposition that once you, as a defense lawyer, in your regime. Uh, you raise impairment because of drugs and alcohol, you also must raise, you must subject your client to a mental health evaluation. And you said, yes, in these circumstances. What circumstances are you refer referring to? I'm referring to that he raised it both in the motion to suppress and at trial. And it was key. There was no way to escape a life without parole conviction in this case without impairing, without raising an impairment defense to the armed robbery. Those are the circumstances. I see that my time is over. No, I'd um, like you to address the, you know, the issue you want to address, because I have, the judge seems to not like our Brown decision, and that's driving a lot of what he's doing. So I don't, I don't think that that's true, Your Honor. He says, he, he finds that, he, he, he comments on Brown not being consistent with this, so. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really don't what read it that way. What is the basis of what he's, what is the legitimate basis of what he's yep. doing to lower the verdict? Because um, it's, it's not that Brown is not a good decision. That's not his call. Um, so I, I just direct the court to addendum uh, page 102, which is the motion judge's decision. Um, I'm sorry, 112. Um, and he, he just says, look, I, I recognize that Brown is not retroactive. That's not what I'm doing here. Um, I am just rec uh, using my Rule 25 powers um, to re reduce a conviction which is out of proportion to the defendant's culpability, right? And that's what happened in Brown. Brown didn't get the benefit of Brown, right? He got a proportionality reduction, right? Um, having to do with culpability. And Mr. Rogers' culpability in this case is especially where it's built on multiple legal constructs where the jury never considered whether he had malice. And in fact, when they had the opportunity to consider whether he had malice, both as to Henry Young and as to Christian Jambrone, they, they rejected it, right? So what the judge is saying, I've read the transcript, I've heard the testimony of Michael Andrick as to hyper-defensiveness, I've, I've heard the testimony of Dr. Rin to the extent that he accepted it, and I think that this conviction of first degree murder is out of proportion to his culpability. That is, has long been um, a proper basis under Rule 25. Um, and so, uh, you know, what the Commonwealth wants this court to do is overrule 40 years worth of precedent, right? This court said, we read Rule 25b2 this way, um, it, it, you know, the, the power to reduce continues, um, and if the legislature doesn't like it, they can change it. It's been 40 years, they haven't changed it. Um, so this is really just a straight ahead, culpability-based reduction. The judge properly said, Brown does not apply to this case. Um, and so this is not a time, what the Commonwealth is saying is you should overrule precedent and take away judges' ability to do justice. This is not the time for that. We are at a time in which we are finally coming to grips with some of the real flaws in our criminal legal system. Um, racism, both systemic and acute. Uh, flawed forensics, infle inflexible rules. Um, these are things that- Last part that you wanted to talk about, there were three things. Uh, I'm, I'm clearly not gonna get to it, Your Honor, unless you want me to, well, but- Tell me what it is. It, uh, certainly. Um, the shoplifting issue, the statutory interpretation. Isn't he responsible for the cough medicine and the other things that the other guys are stealing at the same time? Because it's a joint venture, right? So I, I understand the toothpaste may not amount to 100 bucks, but the cough, there's, they're stealing cough. There are three guys shoplifting at the same time, right? So don't we add all those together? We have no evidence. Oh, we do. We know that the other two are stealing cough medicine and some other things, right? Boy, that's never come up, Your Honor. I, I, I'll... It's just, to me, it seems obvious that I'm not just looking at toothpaste. I, I see your point of I'm just looking at toothpaste. It's hard to steal $100 worth, whatever the number is, of toothpaste. But they're stealing a bunch of things. They're basically 
running through the pharmacy taking things. So I'd have to review the, I'm, I'd, li I'd, I'd like the opportunity to respond to that in a letter. I'll review the record to see if there's evidence of the value of the other items. But the prosecutor in opening admitted that it wasn't more than $40. Um, and that's what he focused on. Um, toothpaste wasn't more than forty dollars, or that yes. everything was. And that was the only focus. It's a joint venture, right? I mean, so I don't believe the jury was ever charged with joint venture. I don't. So the the, the I thought it's a joint venture felony murder. It's not. It's no. Not, okay. It's not. No. No. Um, if there are no further questions, I rest on my brief. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm sorry, Justice Wendland. I apologize for cutting you off. Not at all. I, we only get 15 minutes, so I'm eager. Okay, Attorney McLean. Good morning, may it please the court. Ian McLean on behalf of the Commonwealth. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the family of 17-year-old murder victim Christian Gambroni, including his mother, that are watching the live stream now this, this morning. Um, Your Honors, 25B2 plays a role, an important role in our system, but it's a limited role. Um, in Q, when this court altered basically the, the, the wording of 25B2, it significantly expanded that role. It's, and when it did so in Q, in footnote three, it invited this court, after we had operated under that new system they were basically creating, it invited this court to revisit it and reconsider it. And that's what we're asking the court to do now. We're not asking the court to eliminate Rule 25B2. We recognize the need for a safety valve in the immediate aftermath of a jury verdict where while, it, while the verdict was legally sufficient, it may not be appropriate. <clears throat> and we think trial judges should have that authority in the immediate aftermath of the trial. However, that doesn't exist in perpetuity. It shouldn't exist in perpetuity, as, as occurred here. Haven't we said multiple times that the strict time deadline that you're trying to impose, we reject? It's not just one case. Haven't we? Yeah, I mean, didn't we do that? Pfeiffer, there's yeah, a five. bunch of them. We've, Very we've been, recently. Yeah, in Pfeiffer, the court declined to reach the argument. It was my case, and the, the court declined to reach the argument itself. So this court has never actually legitimately grappled with the question. Practicality is we did the opposite of what you're arguing, right? We allowed um, something not within this strict time frame. And we've done it, I, I don't know how many times. You're, aren't you paddling seriously upstream here on this? Well, that's fine, Your Honor, but I'm, I'm saying that this court, now that it's got some years of experience with the system that was created as a result of the Q case, when this court, in a footnote, invited the court to revisit it at some point and see if there should be a limitation imposed on the second sentence, now we have that world of cases and it's time for us to look at and reconsider it. And I'm not saying that's your best argument for, you know, what's happened in the course of the time that's caused sort of a disruption in the legal regime. <coughs> that would warrant revisiting and or changing uh, the way we uh, decide 25B2. Well, so respectfully, Your Honor, I would characterize it as correctly recognizing 25B2's place in the system. And there are a series of things, the first of which yeah. is a direct comparison to Rule 30. We're talking about rules of All criminal- right, That existed at the time. So what, what's different now? You know, at any time was in Rule 30. At the time, um, Gilbert was decided saying that 25B2 allowed uh, Judge Gantz and the Superior Court at the time uh, to revisit um, uh, something that are, had already undergone 33E review. Well, the, the, Your Honor, the point is that there's now been enough time that this court has seen, I counted 10 cases that you've had that were post-direct appeal. A 25B2 allowed post-direct appeal is 10 is the number that I counted. There's a litany of other cases that don't make it here to you, but 10 that this court has had. So but I think why, we've got yeah, some experience. So what, what's wrong with that? Because you're reopening the wounds for the families of the murder victims years or decades after the fact when they've been told the conviction is final. You're basically undermining the jury system and the entire appellate review system where when you guys pass on a case and conduct 33E review, looking at the whole case as you're required, to then allow them to reopen the family's wounds and reopen the case, but that's not, what, a, not but on that's the basis what, of a legal error. What, but, well, but it is based on, it's, it can be based on legal error, right? I mean, that's part of what we're looking at. So um, respectfully, you're so, I mean, Mr. Nathanson stands up and talks about, you know, the, the whole innocence project, you know, sort of conception of criminal law, and now you're doing the opposite. So, I mean, and it's more nuanced than both of you are presenting, isn't it? I don't believe so, Your Honor. I think Rule 25 and Rule 30 work in concert. Rule 30 exists with express language saying at any time, which 25B2 does not have. Oh, counsel, I, th I think when you were talking about the courts, you referenced the court's experience under this rule. 
um, which sounds like a stare decisive cis argument, which I think Justice Wentland was getting at, and you have not briefed the issue of stare decisis, but all of your arguments so far have gone to the consideration of whether the court's treatment in Gilbert and other cases was wrong, but that's only one factor. So could you, could you express an argument why it's correct, in addition to arguments on the merits that you're making about finality, why the court should revisit a rule that has been understood to be settled, a settled understanding of how Rule 25 B2 works. I respectfully, Your Honor, I would say it's never been settled. And the, fo the footnote three in the case, in the Q case in 1982 that imposed the, broke 25 B2 into two separate components, in that very case, they dropped a footnote saying, after we've operated under the system for a while, we invite this court to look at it and see how it's working. So I don't think it's ever been clearly settled, and this court has never actually legitimately grappled with it. It's always just been accepted because we were needing to build up that body of cases and that body of laws that we would have enough to look at to consider whether 25B2 was properly being interpreted or not. Counsel, you might disagree with me, but, but we, didn't, we didn't grapple with this and settle this in Pfeiffer last term with the term before. Your Honor, the didn't, court didn't we just do that? Your Honor, the court may have discussed it in Ensemble, I don't know, but in the published opinion, you said the argument's waived and we declined to reach it. So while you may but have had an opportunity to discuss it, I, now's I, the opportunity. I thought we affirmed the court's reduction under 25B2. Yes, Your Honor, you did. The argument that I'm making now is an argument that the court declined to address and expressly said it was waived. So it's not waived here. We've fully preserved it. So now is, I think, the time for the court I, to grapple I, I guess I'm this. not trying to split hairs with you, but we had a, we had a verdict in Pfeiffer. Correct. It was appealed. Correct. Uh, and then it went back to the, the judge on a motion for a new trial. Correct. And under 25B2, the judge reduced the level of culpability. Correct. It was appealed again, and we affirmed that. So I, I, I guess I'm just missing what, what, what we haven't said before, that this is a proper tool and understanding all the consequences and all the implications to it, but we, we've reaffirmed trial judges' discretion to do this if justice requires. Yes, Your Honor. In Pfeiffer, you said the judge, the trial judge and motion judge, same judge, did not abuse her discretion in reducing the verdict. The argument that the Commonwealth was making was, yes, she did in that specific case based on her reasoning, and she lacked the authority to do it all. 25B2 shouldn't apply then. My understanding of the Pfeiffer opinion is the court said, you're arguing about the legitimacy of 25B2 is waived, we're not addressing it. She did not abuse her discretion in that individual case. So that's why I would say the court has not actually passed on this issue. And I think recognizing, and I'd also point to the appeals court in 2018. About the 10 other cases that you mentioned that we've done this, right? You said there are 10 of them where we've gone ahead and done this. Any same sense of waiver in all of those cases or? No, Your Honor, but never actually substantively addressed in anything that's been written. So I don't, from my perspective, the well, court hasn't what, squarely well, grappled well, I'm with sorry, this. I thought Gilbert directly addressed this. I don't, I don't read it that way, Your Honor. I read Gilbert as a discussion about what is within the, what's the difference between 30 and 25 and what power does the judge have under each, not whether In 25. In Gilbert, uh, didn't the uh, motion judge reduce um, the sentence under 25B? Not the sentence, Your Honor. Um, former Chief I'm Justice sorry. Gant the, yes, the, reduced the, a murder one to a murder two because there was an instructional error in the murder one instruction that was never addressed during the appellate process on the case. So really, Gilbert is a rule 30 where there was a legal error that existed in the case. The legal error only infected so much of the cases addressed first degree. So Judge, Justice Gantz gave the Commonwealth the opportunity to accept the rest of the trial that the legal error didn't touch. So really, that decision, despite what it was called, was really a Rule 30 ruling. Okay, and we're not so <clears throat> we understand your argument on this. Can so, I ask oh, you, go, go sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Um, so we, speaking of waiver and Pfeiffer, um, did the Commonwealth here waive any challenge to the scientific methodology used by Dr. Rin? N no, Your Honor. Um, in the Address specifically then opposing counsel's argument uh, to that effect. Well, I'm, I, yes, the Commonwealth is under no burden to ensure that adequate evidence is, I'm under no burden on cross to bring out evidence to address the different elements of the dalbert lanigan test. Our initial written opposition cited both cited Dalbert and Lanigan. He was on notice that that was part of the challenge. And was the <clears throat> opposition focused on the qualifications of Dr. Rin, as uh, counsel suggests? Focused, yes. Focused, yes. Was there any mention as to the um, uh, acceptability of the methodology of this apex theory of panic attacks? 
what, if you read the specific page that of the Commonwealth's initial written opposition that cites Dalbert and Lanigan, it talks about the admissibility of the opinion. So yes, the defendant was on notice that he had to establish the admissibility of the opinion. It's not the Commonwealth's burden during the hearing to make sure that he's aware of the five components of the Dalbert Lanigan test and to make sure he presents evidence on those five components. And now he suggests at oral argument at least that um, he was not able to bring forward um, because it would have been hearsay any support outside of Dr. Rin's testimony. Can you address that? He can offer as many studies or reports or exhibits as he wants to offer in the evidentiary hearing. He offered what he offered. And the motion judge found that that didn't meet the Dalbert Lanigan factors. And Your Honor, respectfully, we've already, in addressing the merits, we've already jumped over the actual gatekeeper aspect of this, of whether this claim, this entire claim is new and substantial. Well, ineffective assistance <clears throat> of counsel, isn't that new? No, Your Honor. No. Um, so you, you're saying that trial counsel, even though that same person was appellate counsel, could have raised an ineffective assistance of counsel? Absolutely, Your Honor. Okay. <clears throat> There's so, no so prohibition on that at all. Um, he was convicted in 2007. His direct appeal happened in 2011. Um, that's a four-year time frame when they could have raised a motion for a new trial alleging ineffective assistance of counsel, when he could have sought a different attorney if he wanted, when he could have raised it in his direct appeal. Can you address our decision then in 1998, Smith? Uh, where trial counsel is appellate counsel on direct review, the claim of ineffective assistance based on failure to act is new. No, I can't, Your Honor. So, okay. even, so, even so if, let's just assume Smith is still good law even and if, the ineffective assistance of counsel is new. Um, can you, what about the judge's decision, the motion judge's decision, um, applying Daubert Lanigan um, is, is, is correct. It seems to me that the, the motion judge did go off and become his own little mini scientist and um, looked at the DSM and started looking at these factors for panic disorder. And I'm wondering, you know, why is that acceptable? The motion judge went beyond trying to help the defense and come up and make up for the inadequacies, inadequacies of their presentation in the evidentiary hearing. If anything, he did even more to try to help them than he was required to do. He could have simply written one paragraph and said, you didn't even come close on the five Dalbert Lanigan factors you lose. He did some legal research himself to see if he could find other cases where it had been, where it had been used in, in courts, didn't find any. Now, it, their claim that he went all through the DSM and examined it himself is simply not accurate. Dr. Rin testified, the closest thing in the DSM is this condition X, which I have not diagnosed him with. That's it. The panic um, disorder. Correct, Your Honor. That's at transcript page 51. So right there, there is an admission from their expert that this condition is not a re this. But that was the whole foundation of his testimony. His testimony was not that this was related to a DSM four or five condition. That was the nature of his testimony. And the judge did talk about, I, I, correct, please correct me if I've got taken a wrong impression from the briefs, but the judge talked about a number of things that the judge looked up in the DSM that were not at all discussed in the testimony, such as regarding um, specific, specify, specif specifiers or specificity, basically the idea of panic as sort of a I don't fully understand it, but a subcategory, can you address that? Your Honor, even if you want to strike that from his ruling, how does it detract from the fact, the finding that this condition, the closest condition that exists that's in the DSM is a condition that he doesn't have? Can you address the argument of the other side? I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts. Like hmm. that the whole point here is that this is about impairment and one can show impairment per gray, not just from a DSM four or five condition. That's the whole argument here. The, count, the, the expert was not purporting to say that he had a particular DSM, et cetera. Can you, can you address that? Well, I'd, I'd start with saying that I think, I think Gray is distinguishable, and really the focus here is it's, as it's an ineffective assistance claim, it's whether the trial counsel's decision to not consult an expert fell measurably below that which would be expected of an ordinary, otherwise fallible attorney. We're not on 33E, so it's the regular Safarian standard here. Um, and there was no reason here why this defendant tipped him off that he needed to go out and get a mental health expert. This is not one of those categories of cases where it's demonstrably obvious where the defendant tells him, I've got this mental health condition you should look into. What was apparent from the facts here was what the defense that he pursued, intoxication. And he adequately pursued that. If, if you go so far as to say this falls measurably below, then you're saying that every lawyer in every case has to hire a mental health expert to evaluate the defendant and see if there's some basis. The facts of the case here show that the defendant was executing a plan. The day before, he said, if they pursue us out while we're stealing stuff, I'll stab them. 
Then what happened? He was pursued out the next day, took out his knife, and stabbed two people, one, say, of, one of them he, failed. By the way, did he say, I'll stab them, or did he say, I'll, I'll do something, right? I, did he use the word stab? He used a profanity, Your Honor. He said, I'll, I'll fuck him up. <clears throat> That's a little different. <clears throat> yeah. um, so he, he, he stated a plan. He executed that plan the next day. Immediately after the stabbing, his actions again suggest he is executing a plan. He then he stabs two people. One remains. He takes flight again. Third person comes after him. He turns around and substantively engages that person and makes another threat. That person backs off. He continues his flight, discards his weapon. Now he's trying to hide the evidence, goes into a hospital through one door, changes his clothes, exits through another door. These are all things that indicate he is executing a plan, not that he has a mental health issue that he needs to hire an expert to consult about. The thing that was apparent from the facts is the intoxication. That's what the trial counsel pursued. His conduct didn't fall measurably below. There's no ineffective assistance basis here. Can I ask you to address the shoplifting um, statute? Well, Your Honor, I'm, I'm going to start there with, again, the same. It's a gatekeeper provision, right? So the first two questions have to be new and substantial. New means it, it couldn't have been raised. The cases that the defendant cited are from 89, 07, 96, 82, 2001. So assuming we reach it anyway, <clears throat> can you address the merits? <clears throat> Well, I think there are, two, there are two things, Your Honor. First of all, it wasn't just that he grabbed a couple of tubes of toothpaste and stuffed them in his jacket. He was working in concert with a team of people that were robbing the store together. Was he, it a joint venture, though? <clears throat> was he charged with a joint venture offense? I'll have to go, I'll have to go, I'll have to go back and reread the instructions, Your Honor. That was how I had interpreted it throughout. Um, <clears throat> then, so, assuming Mr. Nathanson <laughs> says it, he wasn't, I don't know if that's true or not, but if he wasn't, how do we get to the minimum number? Well, that's a lot of toothpaste. Respectfully, Your Honor, I think it's 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 frankly absurd to think if somebody drew a gun, pointed it at me right now, robbed me of all the cash in my wallet, and I happen to have ninety nine dollars, that's not armed robbery. But if I had a hundred, it is. Hold on a second. <clears throat> is that what we're looking at, or how do we evaluate the number? Don't gloss over this because we may have a problem. So why don't you confront the question? How do we deal with this? Well, Your Honor, I think the use of the word, um, the use of the word in the, in the armed robbery statute doesn't, I don't think it means larceny as is legally defined. I think it means larceny as in, uh, in conjunction with the three, the three words that precede it, which I think are uh, take or steal, I think. I forget the exact wording of the statute. Hmm. I think it's meant as a layman's use of that word, not as the legally defined term with a specific dollar amount attached to it. We need a felony, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, Your Honor? Okay. I, I don't know what, this is, this is your shot. You better address it. So go ahead. That's what. We, tell us how we write this section of that opinion. Well, how you write the section of that opinion is the claim is not new, so it doesn't get through the gatekeeper. Get, say you lose <clears throat> on the gatekeeper. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Then there are two ways, Your Honor. First of all, you say if there is a specific dollar amount that it has to be attached to it, then here it was acting in concert with a series of people conducting an armed robbery together. He's responsible for everything that's stolen. It's not a joint venture <clears throat> prosecution. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. That's the first way. And then the second way is to realize, is to acknowledge that the word in the armed robbery statute doesn't attach to the actual separate criminal offense of larceny because it would be absurd, and that's something that we look at in statutory construction, it would be absurd to say, pointing a gun at me and robbing me when I have $99 in my wallet is not armed robbery, but if I have 100 it is. If you point a gun at me and rob me of $99, it's shoplifting? That is an absurd result. So that would not be the way to construe the statute. If there are no further questions. Okay. 